Utah is in the midst of a bye week, which means we have five weeks of game film to look back on. So let's go position by position and review how Utah has fared at each spot so far. How about the QBs? Cam Rising, Isaac Wilson. What do we think about them? Offensive line, every spot. We're breaking it down. Even Coach Witt on today's Locked on Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen and view of the day. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and we appreciate you for making Locked On Utes your first listen of the day. If you haven't done so yet and this is your first listen to our show, welcome. And we are available on YouTube as well as all the major podcast platforms. And if you want to join the conversation, we got YouTube comments as well as social media. We can follow our show at Locked On Utes. Today's episode of Locked On Utes is brought to you by FanDuel. You can place your first $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Guaranteed. You can visit FanDuel.com to get started. My name is JT Wistersill, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. Excited to be joined by a friend of the show, Dante Guardi. And Dante, we're going to be going position by position and breaking down how each group has failed, fared so far with a letter grade. So I want to start at the quarterbacks. It's all the rage. We are not going to go individual by individual because I love that you all love this show. And I know I'm very respectful of the amount of time you take. I don't want to take up two hours of your day if we go player by player. We're going to talk about each group overall. So starting with the quarterbacks, look, it's very interesting, right? Cam rising, uh, the first game and a, and a half, and that's all we got of him. And he was really good when he was in. Some people will try to tell you he wasn't. Eight of the 11 drives he led, led to points for Utah, seven of which were touchdowns. I liked what I saw from Cam rising. Isaac, it's been a roller coaster. Oklahoma State, awesome. Made some winning plays. Sure, tossed some interceptions, but still did enough for Utah to win. And look. Obviously, games like the Arizona game did not go up to par. The Utah State game has its ups and downs. I'm going to grade Wilson on a curve, and I'm going to give Cam because of what he did a benefit about. I'm going to go the Utah quarterback group because I do think there's been some nice spots. And once again, Isaac being a true freshman, I'm grading them on a curve. I'm going to go Utah QBs, get a B- minus through the first few games. Dante, what's your grade for the QBs? No, right in the head with your analyzation of how Cam played with Isaac, it's it's a work in progress, most definitely. But I, I think something that we need to emphasize that a lot of people haven't really touched on is that the, the playbook is extremely, maybe not extremely, that might be a little bit of a generalization, but it's limited with, with him in the game instead of Cam. And we've seen how that has impacted Utah's on-field performance in both the Oklahoma State game and the Arizona game. Um, the easiest way to put it is that the playbook being limited makes it much easier for the opposing defenses to adjust, especially at halftime. When you look at the Oklahoma State game, Utah's offense was moving the ball through the air relatively well in the first half, and then the second half stagnated. I think that's because their play calling becomes too predictable with Isaac Wilson in the game, and it makes it easy for the defense to adjust. Arizona, we saw a similar thing happen where at the beginning of the game, they were moving the ball well through the air. Isaac was making some good throws, and then the second half came around. And it just stagnated, you know, so I think we need to take that into account as well. Um, I'm going to give the Utah quarterbacks a C plus throughout the first five games. I I think we're, we haven't seen the best yet. I, I, it's going to get better each and every week. People don't, people do realize this, but maybe don't take it into account when judging a team's performance. College careers usually are around 20 games. So each game is 5% of an individual player's career they're going to progress a lot and they're going to get much better after each and every game. That's, that's just how it goes. Um, there are going to be growing pains at the beginning. And I think a good point of reference for Isaac Wilson is like, this might be a little bit harsh, but take a look at Michigan state with Aiden Childs. Aiden Childs was a, a better recruit than, than Isaac Wilson was. He had a year sitting behind DJU at Oregon state last year, followed his head coach who he specifically wanted to play for coming out of high school to Michigan state. And, and he looks bad. He looks bad. You know, Isaac Wilson, in my opinion, is ahead of schedule. And not to say Andy Childs is a bad player. I think down the road, eventually, he's going to be a great player, uh, the type of player that the scouts expected him to be coming out of, out of high school. And I think the same for Isaac Wilson. 
Well, he's going to look better if he plays against Arizona State simply because the defense isn't as good. So that's where we. Right. it's important not to overreact to what happens. Just like Oklahoma State's defensive backs, not as good as the ones that Arizona had. So part of the reason he struggled there, and I, I love that you mentioned the play calling. That's part of another reason why I didn't go down to a C. I was going back and forth between C plus and B minus, but when I grade Wilson on the curve, I'm not just countering him being a freshman, but also the play calling as well, which is important. So I think we feel a similar way about the quarterbacks. Running backs. Really close to an A plus. I thought about it. Uh, Mackay Bernard, absolutely an A plus. Like that's without a doubt. But when you think about like Dejon Stanley started so hot, he's kind of cooled off a little bit, right? He had some drops and and some other things there. Mike Mitchell's been good, but I I wanted to see a little bit more there as well. So since we're grading these as groups, I did the running back. I gave him an A. Mackay Bernard once again, A plus. But the rest of the group is what brings it down to an A at least. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Makai has been super efficient, you know, averaging over five yards per carry in every game. Yeah. Uh, and that was six yards per carry before the last game, you know. So, and he was, I, I, before the show, I compared it, his performance against Oklahoma State to a Mariano Rivera type of thing where he just closed it yeah. out and did his job. And that's what you need out of, out of a guy who's been around the block and has seen a thing or two throughout his college career, you know. And he had that quote, I forgot what game it was after where he was saying, uh, I feel like my entire career has led up to me playing like this. Uh, that's the type of thing that you want to hear, especially out of a player that has had some turbulence throughout his career, especially with like the whole transfer portal thing and then coming back. Um, but it's great to see him feeling confident and playing well. So like you said, pretty close to an A plus. And then uh, with Mike Mitchell, I actually, I, I said before the season, he was going to lead the team in rushing. So I was sleeping on Makai with all due respect. He has blown the expectation out of the water relative to where I had him before the season. Um, not to say that Mike Mitchell's been bad by any means. He hasn't been, but I definitely was in this. I definitely am in the same boat as you where I, I, I was expecting a little bit more. But then again, I mean, I mean, we're only five games through the season and we're expecting Utah to play uh, hopefully around 14 or 15 games this season. So there, there's a lot more football to be played. And I mean, it really for a running back specifically, it really only takes a couple of good performances to get the juices flowing, to get some momentum and then eventually segue that into a stellar campaign. So that could still very well be in the works. I mean, we've seen it happen w w with Utah running backs before. I mean, Jaquindon a couple of years ago w w didn't even start the season at running back and then uh, ended up being kind of not necessarily a workhorse, but he was definitely the guy in the backfield. And he ended up having a fantastic season uh, where he averaged over six yards per carry, I think. And that was throughout like the last eight games of the year, I, I want to say. And uh, he ended up breaking a thousand yards type of thing. So he had a very successful season that year and um I, I could totally see something similar happening with with uh mike mitchell maybe even Dijon stanley because you know he started the season off hot and yeah it only takes a couple of good games a couple of good drives to really get the juices flowing and then um end up segueing that into a successful season so i would say for the running backs uh, i'd say yeah and hey, they've done everything we've asked for honestly anything more than this yeah they've done everything we've asked I agree. I think they've done a lot of good things. You could easily give the argument, as we both said before, them having an A+, plus, but I'll keep it as an A for right now. We still got a lot of positions to talk about. We got the wide receivers. We got the offensive line. We got the defense. So do not go anywhere as this episode of Locked On Utes is going to continue to roll on in one moment. But first, we have to talk about our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. I love FanDuel, and all of you who are NFL fans, you absolutely should too because you can start your season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. When you place your first $5 bet, that's FanDuel.com. And yes, there is no Utah this weekend, but there's great games across the college football slate, the National Football League state slate, and we get MLB playoffs. So FanDuel is still the place to go today. Do you guys think that your favorite NFL team is going to keep it rolling? FanDuel is the place to head over to. I'm a big Minnesota Vikings fan. I'm excited to see what they can do against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in London. And however you guys are feeling, whatever games you're eyeing, FanDuel Sportsbook is the place to you. Once again, you can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com today head over to FanDuel now all right Dante as we now look at the Utah wide receiver group this is one actually you know what I want to do together I want to do the wide receivers and the tight ends at the same time because they're pass catchers so I think that's a it's a very similar thing I think for the wide receivers I'm gonna go with B for tight ends 
I'm going to go B+. plus For the wide receivers, I've loved what I've seen from Dorian Singer. He'd be getting an A grade. I've liked what I've seen from Money Parks as well. I'd love if some of the other guys could make a few more plays. Some of that's on them. Some of that's on the offense. The reason the group I moved down to a B is I did think there were a lot of times that Arizona won against them. And there were plays that Utah have to, had to have it, and Arizona DBs were locking them up. So to me, that's where that grade drops a little bit. And there's and it's also where it's hard yet again to grade them because at times it's like, oh, how much of it is in some of the other games, the quarterback play versus the wide receivers. So that's where right now I'm going to go with a B for them. Tight ends, I'm going to go with B plus. I think this is a very similar spot where the quarterback play has impacted them at times too, but there's been drives where I've wanted more from Brant Keithy still, as good as he's been. Uh, some of the other guys, right? Like I would have loved to see more Landon King to this point. Cale Lohner's had some nice spots, but still has had some drops and some inconsistencies. And Dallin Bentley's done some nice things too, but just not there in game out so i think they've been solid but i i still think it's understandable that i'm like you know what i, I still want a little bit more from the wide receivers and tight ends yeah well, for the wide receivers i'll go with uh a b mm -hmm. i like what i've seen out of dorian energy wise however that second half i feel like every time he was targeted he was he was blanketed he was really having oh, trouble creating something you're right. He didn't create so, separation, but he did, he had the big catch in the second half. Yeah, but I mean, nine catches on 18 targets out of our wide receiver one. Yeah. I feel like right. there, there's got to be a little bit more than that production wise. I know maybe the throws weren't all that great, but 50% catch rate. Man, I, I don't know. I feel like we need a little bit more than that. However, I, I love how he's come on this season, and I love how uh, Andy is or has really prioritized him in the offense after the first few weeks where he wasn't really all there. I, I like how he's progressed, uh, and I think by the end of the year, we're going to look back and say he had a great year, you know. Um, so I, I, I like what I've seen out of him so far, but, I mean, I don't know. I've That, la that game last week was just so weird. I felt like we kind of were waiting for somebody to step up, and just nobody really did. Honestly, and maybe I feel like I'm being too harsh on Dorian because I just expected him to be the guy to step up last week because he had a great first half. And he had 150 yards still. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking more like, I mean, nine catches on 18 targets is just so sporadic in my opinion. And I don't know. I, I just, I feel like we need a little bit more than that. And I mean, because he, he had a fantastic first half. He really, he really did. And early on in the game, he was getting targeted and, and producing. And um, outside of him though, uh, I'm I'm definitely wanting a little bit more. Just I, I don't know. I feel like they are leaving a little bit to be desired. The tight end room, I feel comfortable with what the with where the tight ends are at. I feel like they're they kind of they each understand their role and they each have kind of an established role at this point. And that's something that they can work with um, from here on out. Whereas with the wide receivers, it's like I feel like it's Dorian and then it's kind of like everybody else you know i'm kind of waiting for somebody else because money's been getting targeted but he hasn't really been super efficient statistically he hasn't been super efficient and if you were able to step up if he were to be able to step up and produce as a true wide receiver too and give um whoever, whoever's playing quarterback a trustworthy target that'd be awesome and i think that'd be the path on kind of needs to take the next step whereas with the tight ends I, I kind of like the the roles that each of them play where you still have Brant because Brant got banged up last week. Like he wasn't a hundred percent in that second half. That's true. Um, so if people are going to discredit him for that performance, I, I would pump the brakes on that and say he did get banged up. And the fact that he was out there, his body language just showed that he wasn't a hundred percent. So I, I, I'm willing to just say that it was great that he was able to tough it out and play that game. And the best is yet to come from him. And I think the same about Caleb Lohner as, as well. I've been honestly, I've been impressed by him. I wasn't really sure what to expect yeah. hanging into the season. And I, I, I'm pretty stoked with, with, with where he's at in his development. And, yeah, I think the best is yet to come. I just like to see early on in the season that roles are established because the coaches, these guys have talent. You know, they have – it'll they'll come around eventually, in my opinion. And just having an established role and just um, being able to have something to, to like, have – to have a role that you can um, – plan your skill set around going forward, I think is a big thing. And I think the tight ends have that pretty locked down. And uh, Freddie is just an amazing tight ends coach, simply put. So by the end of the year, they'll be, they'll be, a, they'll be a group that we are, are definitely smiling about. So with the tight ends, I'll go B plus receivers B. Um, 
I, th- I think the best is yet to come for both groups. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That game last week is just a real, like, just a real bummer. Well, better, of course. I mean, you don't, Utah doesn't lose at home and they lost at home to an unranked team. And uh, now moving on to our next offensive position, offensive line. I've been really impressed by this group as the season's gone on. I thought they had some rough spots against Baylor, but I'm given they are not the reason this offense stalled against Arizona. The offense had issues because of Isaac Wilson. The receiver's not getting open. Wilson was given the time needed against Oklahoma State. They constantly opened up rushing lanes from Kai Bernard. If you would have given me the, like had me do this after the Baylor game, this grade would have been probably a B minus at the time. Instead, based on the last two performances they have, it's all the way up to an A minus for me. I'm really impressed with what Jim Harding has done with his offensive line. I think they've been consistent in the run game and in pass protection. I really like what I've seen out of them. I agree. I agree. I think this goes hand in hand with my grade for the running backs. I'm gonna give them an A. I'm gonna give them give yeah. them an A. And especially where, I mean, this is still a relatively young group. Mm-hmm. And U- Utah's offensive lines have been a position group where early on in the year, we tend to be a little bit critical. And then by the end of the year, we're like, whoa, that's one of the best units in the conference. You know, so the fact that I'm already giving them an A speaks volumes to how they've done. And they've done just about everything asked of them, in my opinion, um, especially when you look at the rushing production. Makai averaging yeah. over five yards every game. I mean, you can't really ask for much better and over six yards per carry in four of the five games that's even better you know and it's not like utah's played an old miss non-conference schedule where they played just bad fcs level teams i mean utah state's not a fantastic team but that is like their super bowl you know utah coming to town they're going to bring the energy and they're going to give you their best shot similar to how when northern illinois played notre dame like that's Northern Illinois Super Bowl, and it's a rivalry game too. I mean, not not that not that NIU Notre Dame's a rivalry game, but just like the energy in the building and how big of a game it is for the for the other team. Um, you knew they were going to get their best shot, and uh, Utah did get their best shot. You know, Utah State hung around for uh, more longer than a lot of people probably expected them to. You know, and Utah eventually pulled away, and a lot of it was because of the physicality up front and um, Oklahoma State game as well. Like I said earlier, Mikhail Bernard's performance in the second half was really what set the team over the top, and that goes hand-in-hand hand with the offensive line play. The offensive line has been fantastic thus far, and like the rest of the team, I mean, they're only going to get better. You know, we're only five games into the season. They're only going to get better, and by the end of the, end of the year, this is going to be looked at as one of the best offensive line units in, in the nation. I agree. I'm incredibly excited about what they're doing and very optimistic about what this offense can do in the second half of the season. And it's what uh, Utah is working on right now. Uh, last couple of positions we got a preview. We're moving to the defensive side of the ball. Defensive line, I'm going to give them an A. Would have been an A plus, but I did not think they did a great job of getting off of blocks, particularly in the run game against Arizona. Didn't love Logan Fano flying up field when I felt like he should have been taking on blockers at the time. Keanu Tanovasa and Junior Tifuna felt like they should have shed blocks. I talked about this earlier on my show. People were not pleased with the pass rush against Arizona. I felt like Utah actually got pressure more times than not. It was just Noah Fafita on the move, making plays more than anything. So, And maybe if Connor O'Toole was playing, maybe this would be an, an A-plus for the defensive line. But right now I'm going to give him an A because it's doing really good overall. Just needed to be a little bit better in some key spots against Arizona, and maybe that game's a little bit different. It's a lot to ask the, from them, I get it, but that's also what an A grade is. Uh, linebackers, this is a B for me. The absence of Karene Reed has really hurt this group. You look at what Jonathan Hall and especially Sione Fotu, they both struggled against Arizona. Some of Utah's biggest runs were missed tackles by those two players, The them shooting gaps too early, just falling for fakes, going in the wrong gap. Lander's still been really good, but even he at times, it's been like, oh, Lander, you go, go in the wrong gap, let yourself get locked up with an offensive lineman. So Lander's still been the best linebacker. He's been playing really well, but the other linebackers have not been as strong. The absence of Karene Reed. Coming off the game they're coming off of, as well as there's been some other times in games as well where they've left me wanting more that linebacker group has. So I'm going to give them a B, Dante. That's fair. I, I, the, the defensive line is a little bit of an enigma to me because, like you said, they were still able to generate pressure. And while the stats, uh, like the running, the rush defense stats don't look great because Arizona averaged what a little bit over five yards per carry, uh, they had like two massive runs. And outside of the two massive runs, or the chunk play runs. They, they had really a couple of those ten yard runs that that really hurt Utah. But yeah. you know, it wasn't like drive I know in, drive out. 40, 
Yeah, I know there was like a 35 yarder and a 33 yarder. Those were what I was kind of getting at. And that took that mm -hmm. that was like 40 percent of their total rushing yards. So without those two mm -hmm. plays, it, it was a pretty it was a decent performance. Obviously, they could have been better, but like it wasn't awful. Um, and yeah, the lack of the lack of sacks last game. I mean, they were still able to generate pressure, um, which is what makes it an enigma. That's what that's really what it makes it. And the lack the 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 lack of presence of Connor O'Toole and Karene definitely contributes to that because Karene is a leader on this defense and he contributes just about every way possible. Coverage against the run, rushing the passer. I mean, he's an all around star. And without him, it, it, it was evident that Utah was missing some energy, uh, a, a real leader. And I think that's what we, what we saw, you know, that's why Arizona was able to pull off these chunk plays. That's why Utah was just right there and wasn't able to, get to know Fafita when um, he was able to make a play, you know? So uh, it's not, it, I wouldn't really call it a work in progress. I'd say they're, they're just about there. They're just about mm -hmm. there. And that was just a little bit of unlucky performance, I guess, give it a couple of weeks. And I think we'll be pretty stoked about where they're at because there are a lot of veterans uh, on the defensive line. I mean, Connor O'Toole hasn't, he's been injured a lot. Throughout his career. I mean, this is a guy that's been in the building for a while. You know, he understands what's expected of him. Van Fillinger, uh, same type of thing. Maybe he hasn't been injured as much as O'Toole has been, but he has been in the building and he has a lot of experience. Not worried about him. Uh, Junior Tafuna, I mean, he's been a perennial starter on this defense for a while now. Karene, same thing. Lander, uh, obviously got that injury last year, but, I mean, he knows what, what's expected of him. We've seen the flashes because – I mean, I said after the, the the word to describe them after the Baylor game, like Karene and Lander were tearing it apart in that game, man. It was relentless. They just looked relentless and they looked like nobody could stop them. So when they're feeling themselves, this is one of the best uh, linebacker duos in the nation. In my opinion, when everyone's playing at their best on the team, the linebackers are the best unit on the team, in, in my personal opinion. I think when Karene and Lander are both playing at their best, they are the heart and soul of Utah's team this season. And when they're thriving, the defense thrives. You know, they're the backbone of the defense, and they're the who, they're they're they are who set the tone in these big games, in these big moments. And I, I we're gonna see that come around eventually because they've shown flashes um, together separately. All these guys on the front seven have shown flashes, so I wouldn't really be too worried. I'll go. I'll say a B plus, a minus, even a minus. I'll say. Last two groups: cornerbacks and safeties. Cornerbacks, I'm going B+. Plus. I still feel like they've done a lot of really good things overall, but I feel like this last week was so much of, hey, Noah Fafita, these Arizona receivers are going to do a little bit to get open, and that's where I'm going to give them credit. I thought they were really good against Oklahoma State, against some quality receivers that the Cowboys have. Yeah, they got beat early against Utah State, but then they made some adjustments from there. So that's I just felt like so many of the plays that Arizona made were not as much bad Utah defensive backs as much as it was just really good play by Arizona. So that's why I'll go B-plus for that group. Safety's I'm going to go in A-minus. Yes, I think Taylor Johnson and Alec I. Gilman have both made mistakes at times, but overall consistency, I've been very impressed with them. So I've, I'm really liking what I've seen out of this Utah defensive backfield. I'm, I'm high on their production. So B-plus for corners, A-minus for safeties for me. Yeah, for corners, I'll go with – I'll say a B-plus as well, honestly. I haven't really been disappointed by them at all. Um, Smith got burned a couple times in the second half of the last game. That was really the only critique I'd, I'd have. But, I mean, I said it before the show, playing in Morgan Scali's defense as a young player is extremely difficult. Probably the hardest defense to play in, in the entire nation, arguably. Um, being left on an island this early on in your career against some extremely talented Arizona receivers. I mean, they have guys. Tetro McMillan plays all over the field. doesn't matter where they line him up. He is a productive player. It's that simple. And he's a tremendous blend of size and speed. 6'4", and he, they, 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 line him up in the, they line him up in the slot like it's nobody's business, you know, as if it's like what he does on a regular basis. And it's not. It's just he can do that because he's just that good of a player. And they also got Montana Lamonius Craig, who's been in college ball for – a little while now he was at Colorado now Arizona and he's an extremely talented player as well so it wasn't it was a tough matchup and we're gonna see them get better as as the season progresses um and yeah I I'd say a B plus and then for the corners and then for the safety 
He's, I've I've really liked watching Teo play this year. Honestly, I, I had high expectations for him moving to safety, and um, like you said, there have been some lapses, but overall, I, I think he's been pretty good, and he's he's made some plays. Gilman, he's been great, and I like the guys who come over from Stanford. You know, because you know they're going to have a strong work ethic, and they're going to be ready to contribute as soon as they step foot on campus. And um, I think he's been a little bit less consistent than Teo has been, but overall, it's been good. You know, it's nice having a player who's who has experience because you're not going to have a lot of plays that make you scratch your head. You know, it, it, it's been nice having somebody with experience back there because Utah's done pretty a pretty good job in coverage, I think. You know, it's the times that they do get burnt, it's like they're just like a half step behind. You know, it's not like they're getting – it's like there's just total lapses in coverage and guys are wide open, 10 yards of separation. It's like, dang, no Fafita made a perfect row at the perfect time and somebody just got burnt by like a half step, you know? So uh, they're, they're there. They're there, which is what we want to see, especially early on in the season. So I think a B plus for both of those groups is very fair. I agree. Let's round it out with the coaches here. We're going to do Morgan Scally, Kyle Winningham, and Andy Ludwig. Morgan Scally, let me give an A minus. I didn't love some things about the game plan against Utah State, but we'll get what he did against Oklahoma State. There were times he got beat against Arizona, but overall, I'm giving that more on Fafita than anything else. So I guess that's why I'm going to go with an A minus for Morgan. You could easily go an A as well. Um, Andy Ludwig is such an interesting one because there's been times I've loved what he's done with Isaac. I've liked the offense's creativity at times. And then there's been other times like this week where I go, what in the world does this Utah offense look like? And because of that, because it's been up and down, I'm going to go with a B. Could easily go with a B minus, but I'm going to go with a B because I still think it's hard working with a backup, with a true freshman quarterback at times. Kyle Whittingham, going to go A minus as well. I think he's done a good job overall. Part of the minus is I'm going to add is because of the whole Kyle, Witt, the Cam Rising saga. It's just so frustrating, obviously, to continue to go through this whole thing. Um, but Kyle's been good overall, I think, holding this Utah team. But there's been obviously some decisions. The one to punt, I go back and forth on if I love that last game. Part of me is like your offense isn't doing something, but then there's also part of me that's like, would it have been better for Utah to try to be aggressive there? So that's where I and, – and I did feel like Utah got outcoached against Arizona. And so if you get outcoached, you're not going to get an A-plus to me. So that's where I'll go A-minus for him. Um, real quick, Dante, how would you grade those three? Uh, Ludwig is a really tough one to grade at this point in the season because of the quarterback situation. It's that simple. Um, I'd say I'd give him a B right now, honestly. Maybe that's being a little bit too harsh, but there needs there needs to be a little bit more creativity, I think. Um, Scally, I'd give him a yeah, a, a minus at this point, I think is is pretty fair. You know, that Oklahoma State game was was tough. You know, that environment was yeah. was tough to succeed in, and he had them extremely well prepared. You know, I think. Watching the way Mike Gundy acted after the game was awfully weird because he didn't give Utah the props they deserved by any means. I mean, he got completely outcoached in that game, completely outclassed. And I, I, I think if you were to ask him, like, now after he's had time to sit on it, what the hardest defense he's had to play against was in his career, he would probably say it was, it was that one because they just had no answers at all. Obviously, they had a the couple of garbage time scores to make the score look closer than it was. But, I mean, Utah dominated that game defensively. And I think Morgan Scally's game plan had a lot to do with that. And this is still a relatively new group. You know, guys are in positions they weren't at before. And there's some new faces uh, as well. So, um, I think Scally's done a good job managing all of that. And, yeah, I'd give him an A-, minus, maybe even an A. You know what I mean? Even with the offense being lackluster – only giving up 23 points is, is pretty impressive when you take into account the field position game and all that. And, I mean, Fafita had to beat the defense. It wasn't like – like I said, when Utah's defense was beat, it was like they were a half step behind. I know Fafita would make a great throw. It would be just like good – right time at the right place more than anything. And Scali can't necessarily control that. So, yeah, A minus, maybe even an A. And then with Kyle, um, yeah, he definitely did get out coached in that last game. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd give him an A. B plus, yeah, because I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say he's done as good of a job as Scally. So just because of that, I'd say B plus. But mm -hmm. I feel like this was a good wake call. Like if you don't think like nobody's more disappointed about how they played than the guy Whittingham is, you know. So he's gonna he's gonna take it to him. He's gonna get things right. And yeah, I, at this point, Kyle's like totally. I don't know. 
Cal's he knows what he's doing at this point. I, oh. I don't really have any reason to not trust him going forward. And yeah, this this is going to be a great wake up call for the team going forward. I think. And um, when we see them come out with a vengeance in the coming weeks, it's going to be because of the culture that Kyle Whittingham has instilled here and uh, what he's done to make things right over the over the past couple of weeks. I'm not expecting anything less of him this season. I'm not either. This defense is still one of the best in college football, so I'm not overly concerned by what happened against Arizona. They got to clean up some tackling stuff. I have the full confidence they'll do that. They have the personnel in place to make that correction. Offensively, look, you got to get Cam back. If Isaac's the guy, I still think there's a chance that you can have a really good season, but it's going to be very tough with some of the teams that Utah has coming up on their schedule. But either way, none of these position groups we're overly concerned about. Even the coaching stuff, it's correctable. So really excited about the future of this Utah team. That's going to do it for our show today. Dante, I appreciate you stopping by. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me, JT. Pleasure as always. That's going to do it for today's edition of Locked On Utes. So we'll be back with you tomorrow. Fun discussion with Alex Napolis talking about how Utah can make life easier on Cam Rising, if and hopefully when he does return, and especially Isaac Wilson currently, as well as predictions for the second half of Utah's season. We'll see you on tomorrow's Locked On Utes.